I want to give a kind of semi-outsider's view of being a pure mathematician working with deep learning. Okay. And what better place to start than George Orwell? So, so George Orwell wrote amazing books and he also wrote hundreds of really extraordinary essays which I think are all worth reading. And this is an article that he wrote in the Tribune I think about three months after the uh, nuclear weapons had gone off in Japan to end the Second World War. Which? In the UK. So considering how likely we all are to be blown to pieces by it within the next five years, the atomic bomb has not roused so much discussion as might have been expected. <laughs> and then... I think this is the important point, but curiously, little has been said at any rate in print about the question that is of most urgent interest to all of us, namely, how difficult are these things to manufacture? Okay. And I would really recommend reading this essay. I think it's interesting. And so I've paraphrased. So we are all likely to be profoundly affected by deep learning within the next five years, I think. Uh, and I find it curious how few people, people are asking, are we going to use these things to cheat on university exams? There's about 10 articles like that in Australia um, per week. But I find the actual... <laughs> <laughs> but the actual discussion of like, what is this stuff? What can we do with it? Uh, you know, what are the potential dangers? I'm sure something bad is going to happen. There's, I think a lot of good things are going to happen. Uh, we don't seem to be discussing that as much as we should. Uh, and I think it's both interesting and important because I think the broader the community of people working on these ideas, the better the outcome. So I think that we really need to have mathematicians working on this stuff and also we need to have people from all disciplines working and thinking about this stuff. And I think that there's great potential for interaction with deep learning. Okay? I have absolutely no doubt that deep learning will impact mathematics, but I also have no doubt that if it, we as mathematicians think more about deep learning, we can impact. Okay? So, so I just want to give you a picture of, so I've been working with, uh, with deep learning for about three years. Uh, so working with the team at DeepMind we're famous for AlphaGo, et cetera. Uh, and I'm assuming that half of you or something has no experience with deep learning, so I want to explain what deep learning is, uh, at least you know, give a crash course. And also, I, you know, in these talks, I often talk about some of the work of the authors mentioned here, but they're here, and so I can concentrate more on background, which is great. Okay. So this is, in some sense, um, preparation for their talks. So here's a plan. I want to give a crash course in deep learning. What is it? Simple examples in mathematics. Uh, I think it's very important just to look at simple examples, particularly this is our mathematicians, I think, instinct. And it's a very important instinct. And I feel that we need more of these simple examples in mathematics. I want to give some heuristics. So you know, I just want to kind of explain the things that I wish I'd known three years ago entering this subject. And I want to give two applications at the end of actual, genuine research. So what is deep learning? So apologies to the people that already know this stuff, but I, you know, I, I think that some people don't. So that's why I think this is worthwhile. OK, so a neural net in this talk is just a type of function approximator. So we're thinking about a function as being some function on a big vector space, for example, a big real vector space, and we would like to approximate it. Of course, mathematicians have been trying to do this for hundreds of years, and this is a particular way of doing this. Okay? And neural net has now grown to encompass many things, so programs that are differentiable, etc. I don't want to use it in that more general sense. I just want to use a neural net is a type of function approximator. So... This is the type of function that we're approximating, so something from r to the 10,000 to r, for example. So typically, it's a function uh, whose domain is very high dimensional. And the functions that we're approximating are of a particular type. So here's an example of a function which doesn't come up much in pure mathematics. 
<laughs> and regarding the values, so here's an image. So each one of these pixels is a grayscale value between 0 and 255. And so I get a vector in, I don't know, probably 10 million dimensional space or something, a fair bit bigger than that. And then I want to produce a number which is positive on tigers and negative on non-tigers, for example. Or, you know, these are the kind of functions that we're looking at. So typically, so in the origin of machine learning, the functions that we're interested in are the kind of human functions like vision, uh, speech, those kind of functions. So they're very different to the functions that few ma mathematicians usually work with. And notice that this function is very noise stable. So if I change some of these pixels, if I change a lot of this image, I'll still be able to recognize the tigerness of it. So it's a very noise stable function. And also there's large parts of this of the domain here that make no impact on the judgment of whether this is a tiger. So I can completely change the values of this function here without any outcome. Okay? So these shouldn't, are the shouldn't change it. It shouldn't change it, yes, of course. And it may well do. You know, we may think we have a great neural net and then we'll change this pixel here to white and it suddenly says it's not a tiger anymore. Yeah? So here's the kind of setup. Probably you've seen these pictures. So this is the way that deep learning writes a matrix. You know, the, <laughs> every vector talks to every other. Sorry, these are the basis vectors. Every basis vector talks to every other basis vector. This is just encoding a matrix. Um, so we have linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, linear. Uh, so this is probably I should say affine linear here. So the the point is that this is just a this is determined by pretty simple parameters. You know, this might be 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 3 real numbers, for example. And then this ReLU is we've fixed bases throughout. So I'm a representation theorist that I love changing bases and all that kind of thing. I'm not allowed to do that at all here. This is really fixed this basis, so I get a list of 1,000 real numbers. I just set all of the negative ones to zero. That's what happens. Then I continue with my linear, set all the negative ones to zero, continue. So that's, that's the nonlinearity, and of course there's many different choices of nonlinearity, there's many different structures, but this is the kind of basic example. And then what we do is we have some function, we have some function, some target function from here to R, and then we try to approximate it in this space of functions. So in this space of functions coming out of this neural net. And typically we'll do this via gradient descent on some loss function. So we won't actually know our target function. We won't, for example, there's no analytic formula, as far as I know, that recognizes tigers. But we have a whole lot of values of this function. So we have a phi tilde, we have a whole lot of values of this function. And so we can say there's a distance between phi tilde and phi measured by this loss. We can compute gradients, do a gradient update, repeat. And that's training. So here I just want to show you, this is um, a lovely little website called TensorFlow Playground. It's really beautiful, so TensorFlow Playground, if you would like to play with this stuff, I, I meant to include the link, but I didn't. So this is the beginning. So here's our training data. Okay, so if you look at this as a human, you immediately see what's going on. We've got this spiral, one arm of the spiral is orange, the other arm of the spiral is blue. However, you can imagine that this, if this is sitting in 10,000 dimensional space, it might not be so obvious anymore what the, what the pattern is, and you might like to learn that pattern. And what we want to do is train a function which is orange, so negative, on this arm, and blue on, sorry, and positive, i.e. blue, on this arm. Okay? Uh, so the reason that we might like to do that is because if our function is good, then this will predict values of this function that we don't yet know. Okay? So we initialize, so these are just matrices, remember? Can we initialize by some random, so this is our initialization scheme, so we might take, for example, uniformly distributed numbers between minus one and one or something. And then uh, you'll see it at the beginning, so this is just totally random initialization, and the, the value of this function has nothing to do with our training set. But then what we'll do is we'll split this um, into two sets of training and test. And then the test is not seen at all during training. And we only compute this loss function 
on some random subset of the training data. So that's called stochastic gradient descent. And here you can see it operating. Okay, so you can see things moving around. Um, so what's, what is happening at every step is we're wiggling our, you know, if you want to be fancy, you think about these as neurons and you're wiggling the values of, of the neurons, the firing rates of the neurons. And you know, everything's stochastic. My, my initialization is stochastic. My choice of um, things to train on every step is also stochastic. So every time I run this, I'll get a different result. But you hope that there's some uniformity in the things that you get. And you can see it's not doing too badly here. Okay? And you also see other characteristics of training. So for example, you see long periods of no improvement and then sometimes sudden improvement. Sometimes you see, um, see sudden issues where, for example, it might have you might, your learning rate might be too high, so it might be kind of moving too far in a particular direction. Or, so there's a heap of different things that can uh, go wrong and a lot of subtleties in you know, learning rate. You know, how many neurons do I choose here? If I chose my neural net too small, it would be hopeless to do this task. Uh, if I chose it enormously big, it might be very difficult to train or take a long time to train. So there's a lot of choices here. Okay? But you can see it basically. And you know, now it's not doing too badly. Okay. Also, another crucial feature of this is that as mathematicians, you know, we might hope to get some understanding out of this trained neural net. Yeah? But um, that's not guaranteed at all. Now, if you think about the result of this, you're, you know, I actually did this once, so I had a, a model that I really wanted to interpret, and I printed out some matrices and just stared at them and you know, made the fascinating conclusion that I could deduce nothing from... So just some very simple heuristics in terms of what kind of problems one wants to use deep learning on. So the input dimension is high. You know, if your function is in, on a two-dimensional vector space or something, we have many, many tools in mathematics to do that. You, it's really interesting when you have kind of cursive dimensionality. So you know, space is so large that you can't hope to, for example, do a Fourier approximation or something like that. Functions on the unit cube. So that's like might seem arbitrary, but you know, when you use these libraries, they have initialization schemes and stuff like that. So it's import very important to know what the, uh, what the libraries expect. Yeah. And coordinates have low symbolic content. So this is a term that I learned from the DeepMind team. But basically, you don't want kind of small, you want some kind of noise sensitivity. You don't want small changes in your input to drastically affect the output. Okay. So there's this famous curse of dimensionality which is basically that there's a hell of a lot more space in high dimension than you think. And uh, in some settings, this overcomes cursive dimensionality. Okay. So uh, it's very useful for me as a kind of pure mathematician to, to think about the following picture of training. So here I've just taken R2 and I've broken it up into uh, polytopal regions. So these are all polytopal regions. And then what I could imagine is taking a sing single linear function on one of these regions. And if I was trying to change that, I'd be doing linear regression. So I'm trying to learn you know, a line of best fit or something like that, or a hyperplane of best fit. And you can imagine deep learning as being like linear regression, except you're allowed to move your polytopal regions around at the same time. So if you look back at that slide before, in, in the TensorFlow, you can actually see these different regions moving around. Also, I should have said, if something's not clear, just ask me. I have no particular need to get to the end of these slides. So, simple examples in mathematics. Well, one to draw the answer question, you, did, you said on that last slide, one of the desiderata was that it shouldn't be sort of, your function shouldn't be sort of highly sensitive to, let's say, changing a single pixel or something like that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the output sometimes have that property? I mean, it's a, the, so the output is always a piecewise linear function. And it's, um, you know, I always think about it as being some kind of Lipschitz function. So, you know, it, do it doesn't have too much variation. Um, also, another thing that I should have pointed out here is note that in the vast, ma so I've, I've done my fancy neural net and I've learned this function, but notice that this function is very, very boring kind of in any of these regions off to infinity. Yeah, it's just a linear function out, out here. 
So it's really only in this kind of area where, you know, which is by convention the unit cube that you have interesting, interesting stuff going on. Yeah? I, um, I don't think there's any guarantee if you do standard training that you get this kind of robustness property. I mean, you could just get unlucky and your training point lies right on a decision boundary and there's nothing preventing that. Absolutely, yeah. Worse than that, right? I mean, your data is actually an extremely thin subset of... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so that's... Tigers a, are a very unusual subspace of... <laughs> that's, that's an extremely <laughs> important <laughs> point that the... Yeah, so that the... You know, this is not a situation where we have a vector space and we have like a, a good sample of points in that vector space and we're evaluating a function. We have a function that's concentrated on some like very, very... Or, you know, for example, in images in a very interesting submanifold usually much, much lower dimension. Yeah. That's a very important point, yeah. But we have no idea what that... Well, there's manifold, looks like. there's manifold learning which tries to predict that, but yeah, it, that's another subject. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so I just want to give some simple examples in mathematics because I feel like these are very valuable. So here uh, is an example. It was, so we ran this uh, seminar um, in, I guess, a year ago. Yeah, this time last year, where we were going over these basic things. And, uh, and Joel Gibson and I were trying to come up with exercises each week that used machine learning concepts but on mathematical problems. And in week one, we thought, OK, let's try and learn the parity bit. Okay. And... Uh, you notice that this is the most insanely noise-sensitive thing you can come up with. You know, it's the checksum. Like, it's really noise-sensitive, and, um, and it's very difficult to learn with a vanilla neural net. So there's this classic early example in machine learning of the XOR function, which can't be used with, with, can't be learned by a linear perceptron. And this is like kind of the XOR function on drugs, this parity bit function. Yeah? And you can imagine that, like, to, to find hyperplanes that somehow make this work is very complicated. And even if, so, you know, it will train if you train hard enough, but then it won't generalize. And many examples, so, like, this is just a kind of warning for pure mathematicians that, you know, often you come up with these examples, and as pure mathematicians, we tend to hit these kind of cases. So, so, you know, at some point I mentioned this to the people at DeepMind and they're like, oh, you know, that's a really tough, tough example. Like, you really shouldn't have chosen that example as your <laughs> exercise 1A, you know. <laughs> but imagine that I can't talk to someone and I'm sitting at home that I think that I'm just making some mistake and I'm, you know, like getting, getting driven crazy. So it's extremely important, I think, that we have these examples that we know. Like, this is a hard case and, uh, from mathematics because, yeah, I think these mathematical examples are very illustrative. So, you know, as another example that's very difficult is to take uh, two numbers expressed in decimal and to learn how to multiply them. Okay. So I love this example. So this Joel Gibson came up with in the... Excuse me. In your last example, the point is when you try to run your neural network, you will, this will fail or what when you try to learn it? What will happen? So it, it won't train very well and it'll, it'll be visibly struggling. And then... Uh, you know, it won't get it right off the, off the, off the training data, for example. Yeah. So there's, like, this is a very noise-sensitive function, so there's no kind of global pattern that the neural net can pick up on. There are ways of using neural nets to, like, for example, RNNs, I think, will learn this, like, uh, for, I forgot, RNN. Recurrent, recurrent. Recurrent, Our, recurrent neural nets will learn this pretty well, um, and there's other frameworks that will learn it pretty well, but... You know, if you plug it into a vanilla neural net, it won't. Would a human design by hand a neural network that yes. solves this? Yeah, you can design them, but you'll also need a lot of parameters. Yeah, so that's a very good thought exercise that I think is really worthwhile. So that's exactly the next slide. So this is an example. So it's funny, you can come up with examples where you can, as a human, come up with a very simple neural net that will give you 100% accuracy. And somehow, like, trying to do that gives you a lot of intuition about in these simple examples. So here's an example. So consider a permutation of n. And what we want to predict is 
these quantities that are very important in my world, the right and left descent set of the permutation. So the right descent set is just those... So this is a list of numbers from 1 up to n, some permutation. And then I look for which indices is the next one bit, um, smaller than the previous one. Yeah? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 has this being 0. That's the identity permutation. Whereas like 2, 1, 2, 1, 3 or something would... You know, so this is a subset of the numbers up to, from 1 up to n minus 1. Now, this is the left descent set. Okay. And the names should indicate that these are entirely symmetrical concepts. So, and this is uh, a little bit trickier. So if you look at your permutation, you should look at i. So for which i is i plus 1 to the, r r to the left of i? I occurs to the right of I plus 1. I plus 1 should occur to the left of I. Yeah. So these are kind of equally easy to, um, to work out as a human. Yeah. But if you think about embedding this point inside R to the N and then trying to decide this with hyperplanes, there's a very obvious hyperplane that this, does this one. Yeah. Namely, I just take that minus that and look if that's, that quantity is positive. But if you think about how to formulate this one, it's much trickier. Okay, you have to have hyperplanes that kind of decide the I concept and the I plus one concept. And so heuristically, we would expect uh, neural nets to do much better on the first task than on the second. And just to match what I was saying before, here we're training a neural net and we're training a binary classification problem. So we're tr what we're trying to say is 1 in this set is 2 in this set. So we want our output to be n minus 1 real numbers, which are, let's say, positive when i is in the set and negative when it's outside the set. Yeah. This is a binary classification problem. Uh, OK, so what are the results? So I find this amazing both for how incredibly quickly it, it does the right descent set. So it, you know, on permutations of size, 100, oh sorry, of, of permutations of 50, you get very close to 100% accuracy, you know, almost immediately. Like if I put n equals 20 here, the first time it prints, it's already got 100% or something. Yeah, so it's very, very fast training. But on the left ascent, then it really struggles. Okay? And if I, you know, let my laptop run overnight, it will learn this eventually. Uh, but it really, you know, it's a much, much more difficult problem. But now you can, you can like test the hypothesis that the issue is how my vector is sitting in, in, in a vector space. And I can put my matrices in as permutation matrices instead. So now there's no artificial symmetry between left and right. And what happens is you get perfect symmetry. OK? Sorry, how did you input them now? As, as literal permutation matrices. Oh. So, you know. Zeros and ones. Zeros and ones, yeah. So every row and column has a unique one. And the dimension is much larger. So basically, you can think that in the first problem, I'm kind of artificially holding back some inter interesting information for the neural net. And one should never do that. One should always give it as much as possible to work with, even if that means increasing the di dimension. You're not really holding back information, right? I mean, it's the same. Oh, sure. Because yeah. you could just, the x side might not be a permutation. But the, the, the neural net will happily eat an x side, which isn't a permutation at all. And the lovely thing here is you can actually look at the, the functionals that it learns and they kind of align with left and right, which is really beautiful. Yeah. So, okay, so that's a simple, simple example. So the, the point of this is that the representation really matters. How you put stuff into that initial vector space really matters. Yeah. It, you know, it either really matters or you have access to like, you know, a thousand GPUs or something. And then maybe it doesn't matter so much, but it really matters to me on my trusty laptop. So permutation in matrix out, I didn't try. It's a good problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a good... 
And also, like, when you start thinking about these, there's like a thousand exercises you can come up with, and I think they're extremely valuable. And you know, we should start doing them and documenting. How easy them. it is! How easy it is to actually start doing these exercises? Oh, super easy. I mean, I can send you a collab, and you can, you know, like, it's really not difficult. You've got to know Python, uh -huh. um, and then you know, you've got to know a little bit of PyTorch, but PyTorch is pretty easy. And so you can really get going with this stuff in. 10 or 20 minutes, and you can start playing, playing with this. Python is way easier than me. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another example. Um, this is just a really fun thing that I did a few weeks ago with Alex Davies. So this is motivated by this beautiful work of Adam that we'll, talk, we'll hear about. So transformers are something that are a black box in this talk. So they're a sophisticated uh, machine learning architecture, which is, you know, much more. I'll try to emphasize in a second that you start off, you learn what a neural net is, this kind of classic thing that I, and then you basically discover that you never use this except embedded in bigger problems. Um, so, so what does a transformer do? So basically it's just a sophisticated architecture which has an attention mechanism in it. So it's basically, it started off in like, yeah, so basically the, what a transformer is designed to do is my dog is sick, I am going to thee, and then I want to predict the next word conditional on that sentence. Yeah? And the issue there is, you know, the attention mechanism is the fact that what you've just said, like there's aspects of what you've just said that may be irrelevant and there's aspect, as aspects that are very important. Okay? So this is a language model, or is that something else? Well, it's an architecture, it's basically a sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture. So a transformer is something that takes in sequences and spits out well, you know, in the original transform, it takes in sequences, spits out sequences, originally designed for machine translation. But it's turned out to be an incredibly versatile architecture. But I really don't want to go into transformers because that would be uh, uh, like a probably half an hour lecture. But anyway, transformer is like uh, uh, something, and we can ask, can it be good, get good at producing graphs without triangles? So this is a beautiful problem that um, Adam explained to us and I think he'll touch on this in his talk. Uh, but basically, so the answer to this is our bipartite graphs. Yep. Classic example of graphs without triangles, and these have the maximal number of edges uh, without triangles. Yeah? But the question is, can a neural net learn that? So graphs are encoded, so we're using a transformer, so we need sequences in, and at the, Actually, in this case, we, our transformer just kind of, it, it learns um, to, sa it tries to learn to sample things with a high score of something. So in this particular case, our score is like number of edges minus number of triangles or something. Okay? So it's trying to maximize some quantity. So we just put in the sequence of zeros and ones, which are just, if we imagine the adjacency matrix of our graph, all we're doing is we're reading along the top row, reading along the next row. Yeah? So we choose this very arbitrary way of putting the data of what makes a graph into a transformer and ask the transformer, can you get good at producing graphs with that So there isn't even explicit information of how many rows there are? No. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is, I think, really just, you know, this is an example of a nice little experiment one can do. Uh, so, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reach this maximum given by the bipartite graph on, I can't remember what this experiment was, but it's probably like 30 vertices. So we want to do 15 and 15 on both sides. And when that happens, we get this maximal score. And that's, this is a particular run that, that achieves it. Okay? And here, we, we tell the neural net the positional encoding to know that this has some, there's some relation between, e, I, and e, between I and J. That, you know, if in, in the original encoding, it's just getting the zero, one sequence. It has no, no idea it's to do with graphs or anything. Yeah? And it's kind of amazing that it does you know, so, do somewhat well. So each of these are different runs. But you see this overwhelming. It's doing much better when it has that information. So exactly what is the information? So, so part of transformers that I haven't explained is you have a positional encoding, which... Um, you know, in language models, basically tells you where you are in the sentence. But here, your positional encoding can be anything. And here, we just took a vector space of dimension the number of vertices and put in a vector 
which yes, tells you're an edge bit from i to j. Those are basis vectors. Those are basis vectors, yeah. yeah. And there's many such experiments like this where you can, also this is very useful, I think Mark will talk about this a little bit, but you can use this as a kind of trick to tell which aspects of your problem are salient. So imagine that you have a whole lot of different things and you're wondering, like, does your prediction, you know, this is a classic problem in statistics, like, uh, what's it called, attribution or something, where you have, you know, a whole lot of different variables contributing to some outcome and you want to know which variables drive that outcome. This is a way of, way of getting some intuition about that because you can either give that variable to your neural net or not. In yeah. practice, do you find that it's monotone? In other words, if there's five things you might pay attention to, is it, does it sometimes happen that if you pay attention to this, you do okay, and if you pay attention to this, you do okay, and if you pay attention to both, you do bad, or does that never happen? Uh, in my, so I've definitely seen examples where you know, adding too much gets worse, but people, experts tell me that this is basically because of size issues. So in theory, this should never happen, but in practice, it does. Okay. Like uh, my neural net's not big enough. My neural net's not big enough. You mean it hasn't, doesn't have enough nodes, or do you don't have enough GPUs? What do you mean by this? I mean, not enough. For, so, you know, you have width, you have depth, and these are very important, and layer dimensions, mm -hmm. and you can start messing with these. Right. And basically, the more you, the, the larger your neural net, the more expressive it is. So the slower it takes to train. The sl yeah. And the more power you need. And also, yeah, but I'll probably comment on this in a second, but... You know, it's very easy to hit the boundary of what we can train on in any reasonable situation. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I mean, you know. Is it possible to train these transformers on your laptop? Or do you need GPUs for that? Uh, it's possible. So, yeah, transformers need more grunt. Uh, but, yeah. Um, in small examples, you could. But, for example, here, you know, this is an example where we've done, I don't know, like, a hundred different jobs. And that's incredibly illustrative. You know, like ma maybe I just ran this once and I got this one. So it's incredibly useful to be able to do these large scale experiments. And for that, you need access to servers and yeah. So these are some heuristics for mathematics research. So I tried to explain before that the problem matters. So that's, that's really important. The problem matters. I won't try to reconvince convince you of that. So noise, you know, low noise sensitivity, etc. I just want to convince you architecture matters, hardware matters, and training data matters. Okay. So I'll go through this reasonably quickly. So I certainly entered this field thinking all I need to learn is the picture that I displayed on the first slide, and then I can forget about talking to machine learning people and I can just happily train away. Okay? It's absolutely not the case. So one model does not always work. Uh, Complicated problems need sophisticated architectures. So graph neural nets, transformers are the two that will feature in this talk. And also, uh, you know, once you fix an architecture, there's more choices to be made. So layer dimensions, etc. And these need expertise to debug. So you know, even learning rate is an interesting question. Uh, and if you want to know about learning rate, Greg is at this conference, and you know I've learned so much talking to him about this this stuff. Um, is is AlphaGo a, a vanilla neural network? Uh, yeah. No. So, I mean, yeah, AlphaGo is a very complicated piece of software, and I think that's very important to realize that. Uh, so AlphaGo started off as being a, C as a convolutional neural network on board positions that tries to predict both, so there's a policy network, so a, a network that basically says, how well am I going, and a network that says, what move should I next, pl next play? And that achieves something like um, very good amateur bad professional level if you just play against the neural net. Okay? What is decisive is the tree search. So there's this incredible tree search in AlphaGo that uses heuristics. So if, I, if I'm just very good at staring at the board and saying, you know, I play this, then I'm not a great Go player. But if I can explore, well, if I play that, then they play that, then they play that. And if I can go down the search tree effectively, then I become 
you know, ELO 7000 or whatever it is. I think they also had to explicitly tell it about ladders. This <laughs> phenomenon in, in Go. No, I don't think so. I mean, initially, so initially they threw everything they could at it. Initially, it was a supervised training task trying to predict expert moves from a database. And then slowly, it was wound down and down and down. So the version that played least at all, I believe, had all the knowledge of previous Go matches in it. But Alpha Zero has no knowledge whatsoever of any right. Go history. Right. I think Alpha Go, they used ladders, and Alpha Zero, they did. Uh, that's possible, yeah. But at the end, there was something that uses no, no human whatsoever and plays itself 100 billion times in a couple of days and then already beats. But that's still sophisticated. Is Alpha Zero sophisticated? Alpha Zero is better than any of the others. But, but that doesn't necessarily mean the architecture is more sophisticated. No, and even, I think in the final architecture, they abandon the CNN and the policy and um, so the, the two networks are actually just fully connected MLPs, no? I'm not sure, but I think at the end they abandoned the convolutional neural net, which I found very surprising. What? What do you mean by debugging here? <laughs> so like, I, I don't know, so, so typically you have, you know, your, your training curve, which, you know, in an ideal situation, you know, you have train and test and it goes down nicely and you're happy. But things can happen, so you know it might be erratic. Um, you know what's going on? Like you, you need expertise to look at that and say, oh, you know, there's an issue with your learning rate, or you know, there's an issue with your data, or it's overfitting, or all of that kind of stuff is. So it's rather yeah, maybe debugging is the right, the wrong word, but getting stuff to work. <laughs> <laughs> what is the learning rate? Just, oh, oh, sorry, learning rate is step size and gradient gradient set. So training data matters. So how you, you know, it's kind of obvious, but how the, the training data that you give to the machine is extremely important. So uh, we'll see a really striking example of this in a second, but if your training data is infinite, you have to be aware that you might need to make an astute choice of distribution. And that distribution can often be uh, rather subtle. And this is something that bites me all the time. So situations in mathematics often involve edge cases. So I might think, um, I'll, I'll train a neural net to decide whether a matrix is invertible or not. Yeah. And then I just give it a whole lot of random matrices and they're all <laughs> invertible. <Yeah. laughs> okay. and, um, and even situations in which, like, you know, I'm not a machine learning expert, but it's a great... learns that all matrices are invertible. Sorry? Right? Yeah, exactly. Then we have a great, <laughs> have a great theorem. Uh, or, uh, you know, so often I have a situation in which something, you know, it doesn't happen so infrequently, it happens 5% of the time or something. But even then it's rather complicated to get your neural net to, to perform. Okay? And there's people that are experts on this, but I'm not, and so I constantly struggle with this stuff. And I'm just saying this so that, you know, it's not you if, if you start doing this stuff and, and struggle a bit. Okay? So one really needs to talk to experts and it's a... So, yeah, also how you put your data in representation really matters. So hardware matters. We've gone over the little, little... So one of the things is that I've always loved computers and coding, and typically my experience with coding and mathematics is that I do a whole lot of simple cases, and they take no time at all. They're instantaneous. And then maybe I need to do a big calculation, and I hit enter and go to sleep and look the next day. Yeah? But somehow the... The iteration with machine learning is that every time you train, it needs, you know, 20 minutes, a day, two days. And that's a very different workflow to get used to. So you sleep a lot. <laughs> Make a lot of coffee. Yeah. What's, what's that hardware in the picture? Um, I think it is in the Vatican. No, it's Barcelona. The... In the Vatican they it's have the such a machine? Yeah, look at the windows. <laughs> It's, it used to be a church, but it's converted to like, uh, it's, it's in Barcelona. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> it's the new church. <laughs> the new church? The new church of computer science. Yeah, so the new God. God. Living. Oh, the new God. Yes. Okay, so I will creation. definitely not get to the end of the talk. So many of the successes of machine learning have been, so this is very important, I think, to, to, to be aware of. It, it, it's an important, uh, it's an important thing to, keep in mind, which is that 
it's easy to come up with architectures that look like they're going to do great, but just won't train. And a lot of the advances, so for example, this transformer that I keep banging on about, uh, they, tr so one of the amazing things about transformers is that you can do a whole lot of the computations uh, in parallel. So like if you put something into ChatGPT, I heard from someone that it, it needs a few cents, it costs a few cents for OpenAI to run that through, and they're running through all these things in parallel. So it's quite remarkable. Um, you know, the size of these models is totally mind-blowing. Uh, so we've seen this before in that plot. It's really useful to have the ability to iterate over many hyperparameters, and that builds intuition very quickly, rather than just hitting end to waiting half an hour, hitting end to waiting half an hour, et cetera. And one of the things, I'm really fascinated to see where this is going to go, but uh, you've probably heard about emergence in large language models. Um, and this obviously needs extremely large models. Uh, and we're yet to see this in, in mathematics. Okay, so this is a quote from the AlexNet paper. So this was one of the first times that uh, CNNs achieved kind of the... Like, really um, hit benchmarks out of the park. So in the end, the network size is limited mainly by the amount of memory available and the amount of training time that we are willing to tolerate. So all, the, uh, all of our experiments suggest that our results are improved simply by waiting for faster GPUs and bigger data sets to become available. And I think that this has absolutely come true. And I guess this, this guy is kind of behind OpenAI now. So maybe I'll... I'll, maybe I'll just do one example. So I'll ignore my results and give one other example. So I'll just summarize advice for interested mathematicians. Expect to spend time considering, like, experimenting with, with lots of details. It's, you know, it's not surprising that I say in a maths talk that details are important, but the problem is there's just a lot of hype around deep learning that, you know, give it anything and it'll do well. And I just think that's incorrect. Uh, try to work with someone who has background in machine learning for the reasons that I've tried to emphasize. Uh, try to push either mathematics or machine learning. So I think that a lot of people have the tendency to think, oh, you know, reinforcement learning is great. Um, let's try and solve a major conjecture with it. Um, and so you're trying to use something at the frontier of difficulty in machine learning to attack something at the frontier of difficulty in mathematics. And you really don't know you don't have a clear picture of what's working and what's not working. So try to pick, choose some simple example in mathematics and push ML, or try to um, use a very vanilla structure in ML to understand something in, you know, some, something that works out of the box that people, a lot of people have experimented with, and have a precise idea of what you want machine learning to achieve. Okay, so I'll very briefly comment on culture. Maybe I'll just skip this. Basically, I feel like we need some, a community where these simple experiments are valid are valued, and I think it's right that the global mathematics community says, we don't care that your model achieved 95% accuracy. That's totally correct, I think. But I think that as a community, a little bit like uh, in previous talks have highlighted, we really need a kind of a venue for, for these simple experiments. So I want to go over um, a really interesting example. Uh, so I'll just I'll discuss this work of Chardon uh, on transformers and matrix inversion. So this is a problem that, from a mathematical point of view, seems uh, very trivial. So this is this paper of François Chardon, um, linear algebra with transformers from November last year. So basically, what he says is, I want to see if a transformer can learn. Basic operations. So if you think about taking a matrix and inverting it, you can, you can think of the, about this as a very perverse translation task. Yeah. And uh, so what he does is he encodes, so he, he looks at symmetric real-valued matrices with up to two decimal points of precision and encodes them simply, the, the, the entries of the matrix are simply... Uh, elements of a vocabulary. Okay. So, you know, 3.14 and 3.15, the model may as well see monkey and dog. It does not know that 3.14 and 3.15 are close. Okay. So I, it's a little bit like I say to you, 
you know, can you invert the matrix monkey dog pineapple cube? Yeah? It's literally what we're saying. We're giving it a whole lot of examples of this translation process. Okay, so here's, here's an example of the task, the eigenvalue task. So he looks at transposition, addition, matrix vector multiplication, matrix multiplication, eigenvalues, eigenvector, signal value, decomposition, and inversion. So this is the most interesting task. So, you know, there's various encodings as how, to, as how, how you put your real numbers as a sequence. Uh, so, you know, here he just uses a vocabulary which has the uh, real numbers with two decimal places between 0 and 10, I think. And then he has these minus and plus symbols to indicate sign, but he experiments with various encodings. And these go into the transformer, and then out should pop the eigenvalues in, in decreasing order. Okay? So, I, I mean, I just think it's totally remark. It's kind of audacious to even, like, think about this as possible, I think. Is 3 by 3 or n by 4? No, uh, so from 5 by 5 up to 10 by 10. Uh, and I think that this is one of the extraordinary things about ML from my point of view is that the problems that I think are easy, it, it struggles with, but then there's these, these kind of things that it does well on where you just like, really wouldn't expect that. Yeah. Well, imagine if you want a Turing machine to do this, it's also getting some, some kind of input that's not visibly to, visible to it as numbers or anything else, right? I mean, if you, if you write a Turing machine to invert a matrix, it probably is as bad in some sense. Mm. You can also implement all the arithmetic, right, between numbers and all that, but in principle it's all manipulation of symbols. I guess so. I hadn't thought about it like that. So, you know, transformer learns something, like transposition is just learning a permutation of the entry, so it should be pretty easy. Addition, you know, you're kind of memorizing additions in each of the spots. Matrix multiplication, so these are getting progressively harder. So, these are all kind of given, we could imagine how it's do doing it. Uh, but, yeah, and also it, it really works, it works very, like good results on 5 by 5 and some results are good on 10 by 10 and then you get very quickly degrading. Yeah? And what will happen in 20 years time when you just do the same thing but with bigger models? Yeah, I mean it, it's, it's clearly, and he does comment on that how it does, you know, increasing the net does increase the, the capacity. But also, you know, this is not meant to be some kind of way of implementing linear algebra, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, yeah. Yes. But how are they going to multiply matrices of numbers from one by one? Well, they're basically memorizing, like memorizing a multiplication table, I think, <laughs> very roughly. Yeah? Okay, so the numbers are chosen from a set. You're yeah, multiplying 10 digit numbers. Monkey times dog That's... equals cube. Oh. Multiplying 10 digit numbers is completely different because now there's sort of 10 to the 10 possibilities. But also, that statement was for vanilla neural networks, and this is transformers, right? Sorry? That statement about multiplying numbers was about vanilla neural networks, and yeah. this is transformers, so that yeah. is another... It's true, but I think transformers would also really struggle on multiplying integers. Okay. <laughs> Isn't your output vocabulary different from your input vocabulary? Yes. So, so you, make, you allow more symbols on the output to handle multiplication or something? Yeah, so, so transformers have a lovely thing where they just kind of, they keep outputting, and then at some point they have an end of output token. Yeah. And so here in this eigenvalues version, um, it comes in here, da, 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 and then it goes, duck, 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 end. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting is that it could, it's totally foreseeable that it outputs a, something of length 14,000 or something. Yeah. So it could output something that's not well formed, and it does that in essentially none of the cases. Yeah. So it learns very quickly at least the form that the output should have. Uh, okay, so I just want to show you, uh, so I'm basically out of time, so I just want to show you uh, something that I think is really beautiful here, which is, I think, illustrative. So this is, this is by far the most um, interesting, I think, of the results is training eigenvalue prediction. So this is uh, a task where it does well, but it's on the border of what it can do, and so you can really see... Um, differences, for example, in the training set distribution. So here's the, the baseline. So this is sampling Wigner matrices. So this is upper triangular matrix, matrices where my coefficients are just uniformly sampled. And... Uh, 
sorry. I, um, I mean, I'm, hang on, let me just say what I said, said again because I probably said the wrong thing. I'm taking symmetric matrices uh -huh. in which I sample the upper triangular bit uniformly uh -huh. according to some distribution. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, for those that know random matrix theory, uh, the matrices satisfy a semicircle law. And so, for example, it's incredibly unlikely that it, I mean, it, it basically never happens that you'll see, for example, only positive eigenvalues. And you can see here, so it's trained, so th these are the different um, parameters of the distribution. So here when I train on, um, so I here I test on the same thing that I trained on, I get 100% accuracy. Here I just vary the distribution a tiny bit and I get massive drop off in accuracy. Yeah? So here as I change these distributions, my semicircle changes, uh, whereas, yeah, and you see that it's, you get some generalization to other distributions, but not very good. So this is what, what I'm training on, and this is the test, the eigenvalue, decomp the eigenvalue distribution of the testing data. Okay? So this is kind of generalization. I'm giving it some task, and then I'm asking it, what do you say on a dist different distribution? Yeah? It's very interesting. Okay? So this is really remarkable, I think. So here, it's trained either on Wigner Laplace. So Laplace is just, you know, it's, it's another distribution, very important. I won't go into um, what it is. But here, you're taking Wigner matrices um, sampled from a Laplace distribution. And notice this, like, um, you know, it generalizes very well across all these different. So here it's kind of remarkable. Like, it won't, it won't have seen a single matrix, all of whose eigenvalues are positive in training. And yet, you know, it's, um, so this is an example where the, the training distribution is incredibly important. Well, it also doesn't know which of those symbols are supposed to be positive, so. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, this, is, this is a fantastic talk. So if you're interested in this stuff, watch Shaffle's talk. And here's what you missed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 